Upon reaching level 14 in Fallout 3, we have the option to purchase the Lawbringer perk. With the Lawbringer perk, we can loot a finger off of the corpse of any evil karma character whom we kill. These include Raiders, Talon Company, and more. The description of the perk then goes on to say that we can sell these fingers to a particular person whose identity will be disclosed after we take the perk. Upon taking the perk, we get a note in our inventory called The Regulators. Attention lawbringers of the Capital Wasteland. The Regulators require your aid in bringing the scum and pestilence that inhabit our home to justice. Report to Sonora Cruz at the Regulator headquarters for details. This then adds a new map marker to our map, showing us the location of the Regulator Headquarters. However, when I got this perk, I was in the middle of working on a video about the Arlington Cemetery. I had just finished exploring the Arlington Wasteland Metro. Upon emerging from the other side, I found a small band of raiders guarding the entrance to the Arlington Cemetery. After they were dead, I began to climb the steps to the cemetery when I found a dead regulator lying on the steps. On his body, we find some ammunition, a note called Bounty Notice, Junders Plunkett, and the Regulator Duster. The Regulator Duster is a light piece of armor with a DR of only 5, but it grants us plus 5 to small guns and plus 1 to charisma. The Bounty Notice reads like this. Notice to all good men and women seeking lawful bounties in the Capital Wastes. Let it be known that the murderous person known as Junders Plunkett, of fair complexion, average height, and missing one good eyeball, is offered for bounty, either dead or alive in the sum of 1,000 caps or similar compensation of expended equipment and or medical expense. Junders Plunkett was last seen committing theft and murder in the township of Canterbury Commons. The apprehending person should exercise special caution, as the bountied personage is noted for an uncommon aptitude with small concealable blades. So, the picture becomes clear. This is the body of a regulator a man who had been given a bounty to go kill Junders Plunkett. Since his body is here on the steps to Arlington Cemetery, we can only assume that Junders Plunkett is here somewhere. Well, this may be a happy coincidence. I need to check in with Sonora Cruz at the Regulator headquarters anyway. Might as well as take on this guy's bounty while I'm here. Heading up the steps, and we arrive at the Arlington Cemetery. I wasn't thinking about it much when I was on my way here, but after I arrived, I did become a bit overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of tombstones here. Of course, the graves we find here are not nearly as numerous as the ones in the real Arlington Cemetery. The real Arlington Cemetery has innumerable gravestones. It started as a place where the United States buried dead soldiers from the Civil War, and since then, servicemen and women from many wars in America's history have been buried here to honor them. In Fallout 3, it is a particularly dead place. But despite the starkness of the cemetery, I did find a bit of green. From one gravestone, I found a flower growing, which is shocking in Fallout 3. The Capital Wasteland is notorious for having no green in sight. In fact, that was one of the design principles Bethesda had when designing the Capital Wastelands. No green living thing. But they made an exception here in the Arlington Cemetery. Here we find at least one living, growing flower. There are no major battles here in the Arlington Cemetery. I'm not sure if this was a design choice by Bethesda. Maybe they didn't want to turn the nation's largest cemetery into a battleground. Instead, we can wander the cemetery, take in the bleak atmosphere, and explore some of the monuments to the dead. Aside from the tombstones on every hill, there are a handful of larger monuments. Giant marble pagodas, some made of larger pillars. I'm not sure if these are headstones or entrances to crypts. They're certainly not in the game. Maybe they were just a place for visitors to relax while honoring the dead. Now there is one structure of note here in the Arlington Cemetery, and that's the Arlington House. In Fallout 3, it's a small brick structure on top of a hill. But in the real world, the Arlington House is a beautiful mansion. And that's because the Arlington House was the former home of Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee, as many know, was the general-in-chief of the Confederate forces during the Civil War. The United States turned his home into a cemetery where they buried soldiers who died in the Civil War. 
I visited this place when I was a child. I went on a trip to Washington, D.C., but the significance of that didn't hit me at that time. Only by visiting it again in Fallout 3 did it suddenly dawn on me. Scholars estimate that over 620,000 soldiers died in the Civil War. The United States buried many of them in the backyard of the house owned by the General of the Confederacy. In the real world, his home was a big, beautiful mansion. But in the capital wastelands of Fallout 3, it's a rather inconspicuous little brick shack. Heading inside, we see an interior that we should be well familiar with if we've explored any homes in Fallout 3. This interior is reused from house to house. But the lighting on the inside is beautiful. Streaks of light come from the boarded up windows and we can see a thin mist in this large entry room. Heading around the corner leads us to the dining room and kitchen. Inside the kitchen, we find a first aid kit with some randomized loot and on the table, a big book of science. It was here that I heard somebody moving in a room nearby. We need to be sneaky from here on out because we may have just found Junders Plunkett. Heading out of the kitchen and going into the dining room, we find one large cabinet. Inside, we find a sawed-off shotgun and some ammunition. And next to this is a bathroom with nothing inside. Heading back out into the entryway, we can go up some steps to the top floor. The room immediately to the left is filled with children's toys. This is interesting considering the significance of the location where we are at. None of these toys are Civil War era toys. In fact, we find a vault tech lunchbox here and roller skates. So I think this leaves us with one of two possible conclusions. Either after the divergence in the Fallout world, a family continued to live in Robert E. Lee's ancestral home built atop a Civil War graveyard, or that after the Great War that ended in nuclear fire, scavengers moved into this home and brought with them many pre-war trinkets like lunchboxes and roller skates. They must have had a child with them, which is why we find children toys in this room. The bathroom is pretty bare, but we can go into the master bedroom. Here we find a blasted out pre-war terminal and a cabinet against the wall. Behind it, we find hidden an easy locked wall safe filled with randomized loot. And that's the entirety of the upstairs and we didn't find Junders Plunkett. He must be in the only room left, which is the formal dining room. Heading on through, we see a big formal table with some chairs and a luxurious carpet, but there's no one here. We do, however, see a doorway against the western wall, creeping around the corner. Hey! <laughs> Hey, he shocked me, and I killed him. Well, he was hostile to me, so I guess I don't feel too bad. But this was indeed the man we were looking for, Junders Plunkett himself. On his body, we find Junders Plunkett's finger, which I suppose we need to bring with us to give to the regulators, and Plunkett's valid points. Heading on inside, we can turn off the radio, which was playing Enclave Radio, strangely enough before exploring this new weapon. Plunkett's valid points are some spiked brass knuckles. They have 10 damage and they look like pretty traditional spiked brass knuckles. Nothing terribly amazing here, but after examining them looking at the wall, we see none other than the Luck bobblehead. The inscription on the base reads, there's only one way to give 110%. Your luck has been permanently increased by one. We can then loot the remainder of this basement. There's some rad X on the shelf, and then in the corner we find a very easy locked safe with some randomized loot inside. We can loot each of these boxes one by one. There's a footlocker and a suitcase against one wall. Heading on over to the southern wall, we find a tool cabinet and a workbench, a refrigerator filled with all sorts of booze in typical Raider fashion. And, and then against the northern wall, we find a shrine a shrine to Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> oh, oh, I mean, I, <laughs> I... The irony is palpable. In the basement of Robert E. Lee's house, the man who led the Confederacy against the Union, we find a shrine to Abraham Lincoln, of all people. Did Plunkett put this shrine up? I suppose we could say that the portrait had been here forever, but these lanterns are still lit. And there are fresh flowers in the vases. Fresh flowers in the Capital Wasteland? Where did Plunkett get these fresh flowers? He must have caught these from some of the graves. He snipped these flowers from the graves of fallen American soldiers and then put them in vases as part of a shrine to Abraham Lincoln. Why did this raider idolize Abraham Lincoln? 
Plunkett had a bed against the eastern wall. We can unlock a very easy locked first aid kit to get some random chems. And then there are a couple of vials of whiskey under his bed. Heading back topside, I was really curious. I wanted to see exactly how much green life was left in this cemetery. I think it's touching that Bethesda decided to keep this entire capital wasteland devoid of any green, but the only exceptions they made were here in this cemetery. After scouring the entire cemetery, I found three living flowers. There's a gravestone right next to the Arlington house that's got two flowers growing out of it. Really close to this one, heading just east of it, we find another gravestone that has three flowers growing out of it. It. And then the last one was hard to find. I had to run to the easternmost corner of this graveyard to find one more grave with two flowers growing out of it. And that's it. Aside from the flowers that Plunkett cut, these are the only living green things that I can find in the Capital Wasteland. Unless you count the Oasis. But that's a video for another day. With the Arlington Cemetery fully explored, we can finally head over to find the Regulators HQ. The Regulators headquarters is a short walk away from the Scrapyard. Now we've been to the Scrapyard in the past. I covered it in a previous video. This is after all where we found Dogmeat. Hey there, boy. I love you too, buddy. But inside the Scrapyard, we find this shack. Heading on up to the door, we see that it's locked and it requires a key, but we don't have the key, and there's no key to be found in the scrapyard. That's because this nondescript shack is actually the secret headquarters of Littlehorn and Associates. We don't know much about Littlehorn and Associates, but we do know that this is an evil crime group that is responsible for sending assassins to kill people with good karma. We only gain access to this shack if we take the Contract Killer perk. This is the Evil Karma alternative to the Lawbringer perk, where you can turn in the ears of Good Karma people you've slain for rewards. However, I'm playing a Good Karma character for this run through, so we will tackle Littlehorn and Associates in another video on another day. Instead, we still need to head out and find the headquarters for the Regulators. The headquarters is just a short walk east of the Scrapyard. Now, for those familiar with the original Fallout game, we need to clarify that the Regulators are not the same Regulators that we find at the Boneyard in Fallout 1. Those Regulators were a Raider gang. The Regulators in Fallout 3 are entirely different and unrelated. We find the Regulator Headquarters as we approach a big Brahmin farm. We see Brahmin lumbering around in the pastures just outside and a windmill right next to the shack. Heading inside, we hear them listening to Enclave Radio and we see a group of men and women dressed in the same way as the Regulator whose corpse we found at the Arlington Cemetery. This ragtag band of law keepers is led by Sonora Cruz. I'm guessing that you've come about the notice. You know, I've heard about you. You're not bad people from what I understand, and the regulators can always use good folks. So what do you say? You read the notice and you're here, so I'm guessing that you want to ride with us. Am I right? We can respond as a typical mercenary and say, I'm not one for causes, I just want to get paid. Fair enough. We'll still take the help where we can get it. So the deal is this, there are a lot of evil assholes out there. Take them down, bring us their fingers as proof, and we'll pay you for each. We'll be watching you until we know you can be trusted. So don't try anything stupid. The other response rewards us with the regulator outfit. Instead, we can say, yes, I want to join you. Fantastic. Take this coat. We all wear them. The unrighteous fear the sight of the regulators. Now, as for the rest, here's the only thing we want from you. Hunt down the evil, the wicked, and the villainous. Bring them to justice. Bring us their fingers as proof of the deed. We'll pay you a bounty for each one. Simple, right? Questions? What do you do here, Sonora? We're the regulators. We've dedicated our lives to bringing the evil to justice. And out in the wasteland, there's only one brand of justice. The gun. What do you do with all of these fingers? Nothing. Nothing at all. They only serve to mark the fact that justice has been done. While we trust our members not to take innocent lives for profit, having a record of the deed is sometimes necessary. While we don't have liars in our midst, occasionally we all embellish a bit. Are the people we see here in this shack all of the regulators in the Capital Wasteland? Oh no. We're spread all around. 
The few here just assist me in organizing things here at the headquarters. There are regulators everywhere. The thing is, if you see them, then they're likely the last thing that you'll see. Well, I've got some fingers to turn in. The unrighteous will fall. Let me see how many you've brought to justice. We can then decline or give Sonora all of the fingers we've collected. We typically get five caps per finger, but if we have very good karma, we get ten caps per finger. You've done good work. Not only that, but the other regulators have told me of your other actions in your travels. Good deeds should not go unrewarded, and so I will add on a bonus to your normal bounty. And we gain positive karma. We can also tell her that we killed Junders Plunkett. Well, it's about time someone put that bastard out of his misery. And here's the reward for it. Spend it well, Lawbringer. And we get the bounty, 1,000 caps. Now that we have joined the regulators, we can walk around and loot the place as we will. These regulators have an interesting philosophy. Stay true to yourself and to the law. This is the rule of the regulator. Well, but what if staying true to myself means that I'm a criminal? What if being a thief and a murderer is the truest me I can be? I don't know. I dislike it when people say, stay true to yourself, or follow your heart. I think these kind of phrases are just empty and don't really mean anything. But I'm still glad the regulators are here. At least someone is trying to punish evildoers. We can find a little bit of ammunition and chems here, and of note we find a copy of guns and bullets underneath one of the beds. Once we become a regulator, we can loot it without stealing. Now even after we join the regulators, if our karma dips to evil, we'll find the regulators around every corner. They will hunt us down and attack us, just like the Talon Company does if our karma is too good. We don't know much more than this about the regulators. The official Fallout 3 strategy guide tells us that the regulators here in the Capital Wasteland were established 10 years ago by an unnamed and mysterious group. This group gives the regulators the caps they need to pay the bounties to their agents. But we don't know what this group is. Is it a pre-war entity? Where do these mysterious benefactors live? We just don't have any answers. But like Sonora told us, they do have agents everywhere, including Lucas Sims. That's right, the Sheriff of Megaton is a regulator. And once you think about it, he's not hiding very well. He has a regulator outfit, the cowboy hat and the long duster. Now, I can't help but feel that this whole thing is really silly. Firstly, how do the regulators know that we're only chopping off the fingers of evil people? Sonora tried to address this by saying that they're watching, they're going to be able to tell whether or not we're cutting off the fingers of evil or good people, but how do they know? If they have eyes everywhere, why do they need me? If they're watching me when I kill an evil karma person, why couldn't they be there to kill that person themselves? Why did they need me? Secondly, every human, well, most humans, have ten fingers. Ten! How do they know that I'm not cheating the system somehow and chopping off all of the fingers of one person and turning it in for a larger reward? Now, maybe we could say that they only accept index fingers. Okay, index fingers, but people have two index fingers, typically. I don't know about you, but if I were to see two dismembered index fingers, I wouldn't be able to tell which one came from which hand. How do you tell the difference between a left or right hand index finger? Well, maybe we could say fingerprints, fingerprints. Okay, so somehow these regulators have a database of fingerprints of everyone post-war? No, that just doesn't make sense. There's no way that they can properly identify these people by fingerprints when you don't even have a computer network where you can store a database of fingerprints, let alone the fact that there's no way that everyone after the bombs has been fingerprinted by the regulators. Now, the alternative is true as well for the Little Horn and Associates. They want ears, but most people have two ears. How do you know you're not cheating the system by hacking off both ears? How can you tell the difference between a left ear and a right ear? Oh wait, actually, no wait, you can tell the difference between a left ear and a right ear. Now that I think about it, that one is obvious. Okay, that one makes sense, but the finger one does not make sense. I can't tell the difference between a left index finger and a right index finger, so... This whole thing sounds a little silly to me. They might as well just take the head. Why don't they ask for the head? They should just say, yes, we're headhunters, we want you to go collect heads. Maybe Bethesda thought that was just a little bit too grisly for Fallout 3. At any rate, I'm glad I took the perk. 
I'm killing these raiders and Talon Company anyway. I might as well collect their fingers for an additional reward. Plus, I think the cowboy hat and duster look fantastic. But what about you? What did you do in your game? Did you join the Regulators? Or did you join Little Horn and Associates? Or did you take a strictly neutral approach? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week, so if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I'm getting ready to launch a big series on Honest Hearts from Fallout New Vegas. I hope you're excited about it because I'm really excited about it. I've almost finished recording all of my footage and completing the DLC, and I have to tell you right now, I am in love with it. The story is so great. I can't wait to tell that story, so stay tuned for that. I take Sundays off, so I'm not going to have a video for you Monday, but never fear, I'll be back Tuesday morning with a brand new video for you. Until then, if you want to support me, you can buy a shirt from my shirt shop, I link to it in the description below, or if you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to private channels on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.